Greece to get out of the Eurozone. Uh, Greece wants in, so do all the rest. So uh, even if we have a deal now, I think things could explode in November once again, once Greece will have its first review of the bailout program. Yeah, it's done every three months. So um, I, we'll have another crisis in November. I have no idea how it'll turn out. We might, ha if, if crisis is avoided now, it'll come back to haunt us in November. And uh, so we have to keep an eye open on that. Uh, that's why I'm here for, to keep you informed about that. Now I'll move on to another theme in the Eurozone. We also have some good news. So thanks to all the ECB action, we have a better economic uh, background in the Eurozone. The money coming from the ECB via the negative deposit rate and low lending rate in general, and all the QE money, all the money that the ECB prints, is uh, giving banks more, much more money to lend. This uh, goes to mortgages, this goes to businesses, this goes to, of course, speculation, also outside the Eurozone. Uh, but economic environment is certainly improving. Credit conditions are better uh, than they used to be. Second reason is, well, the side effect is the euro is weaker. Now, uh, okay, it hasn't weakened so much in recent months, and in the past uh, day or so, it's becoming even stronger. But in general, it's uh, about, uh, it's weaker against the dollar, it's weaker against the pound, uh, it's, of course, uh, uh, weaker still against the Chinese uh, yuan, so this also helps uh, encourage the local economies, lift inflation a bit, and uh, of course helps exports. Another factor that well isn't totally unrelated, but uh, oil prices remain low. They've tumbled down in the second half of last year and then totally collapsed in November after the OPEC decision. Since then, they've been fluctuating in a range, but they've never really recovered. Been between 45 to 60 dollars on the WTI, and they used to be around 100, just to give a sort of general indication. So it also helps the eurozone as it leaves more money in uh, pockets of companies and of individuals. So all this is good news for the eurozone, uh, and we're seeing positive signs. Where I am here in Spain, Spanish economy is growing very rapidly. It grew at about one percent in the second quarter, and at a similar pace in the first quarter. Uh, core CPI continues rising, so if oil and food keep inflation low, just uh, around 0.2%, 0.4%, core CPI continues rising from the bottom, and, and it it is at uh, 1%. The target of the ECB is, of course, headline inflation, not core inflation. That's different from the U United States. But in any case, um, it shows that there is some positive momentum. Also, um, PMI is purchasing managers... Indices are looking better. These are forward-looking figures, and they show uh, more growth ahead. Not everything is good. We're still beginning from a very low point. Uh, unemployment is still above 11% in the Eurozone. Even in Spain, which I just mentioned, that is re recovering. And the unemployment rate is above 22%. German business sentiment that we learned uh, this week is, uh, well, from the zoo, and then we'll learn from IFO. It's still stuck. It's falling even. Uh, according to Zoo, uh, and consumer sentiment is also stuck. So the road is still long, but we are seeing, if you want, uh, green sprouts or uh, some signs that the policy is working, that the longer the weaker euro and weak oil prices and ECB policy, everything together, as long as it persists, it gives a wider and stronger basis for a real recovery. Uh, what should we look out for in the Eurozone in terms of economic data? Well, we have GDP releases on Friday this week. Um, these are preliminary figures, but they are always uh, confirmed. Or all, all, well, there are hardly any revisions. We have PMIs next week, the initial ones for August. And, of course, what the ECB says. The next ECB meeting is held in early September. Um, we'll hear from Draghi also updated forecasts about GDP, about inflation, if he'll be upbeat about uh, GDP, inflation, employment, it'll be, of course, positive for the euro, uh, but he might choose to paint a darker picture just to keep the euro low and to continue helping the recovery. So this man here, Mario Draghi, president of the ECB, has, still has a lot of power, of course, even though he holds meetings uh, only every, once every six weeks. It used to be once every month. 
And now we'll uh, cross the pond uh, to the United States of America. So we had the rate decision in late July. Um, the Federal Reserve had a meeting without a press conference and without um, uh, new forecasts. But, of course, markets looked at every word. It left the door open for a rate hike in September, but mm, stressed once again that everything is data dependent. Uh, the Fed has two main mandates, employment and inflation, and these uh, um, figures go in different directions, and this is what make things, makes things quite confusing. Uh, where is my... Okay. So, employment, that's the, the good news. Um, let's see... Oh. Okay, employment. So, in recent months, we had steady gains, which is very good. 200,000 plus job gains in, uh, on a monthly basis, according to the non-farm payrolls. The JOLTS figure, the job openings, which, which the Fed looks at, it's at decade plus highs, 5.36 uh, million uh, last time. We had up, an updated figure just a few minutes ago. Let's see if I can get you the latest number. Uh, well, it fell a bit to 5.25, but it's still quite good news. Uh, jobs claims reached the lowest since the 70s, to 255 a few weeks ago, and they remain at very low levels. So if we look only at jobs, the ver verdict is quite clear. Hike interest rates now before the economy boils. But, um, well, before the but, before inflation... Let's look at the recent figures of the non-farm payrolls, just the last report on Friday. We had, again, a very steady gain, 250,000, as ex almost as expected, hardly any revisions. The same unemployment rate, very low, 5.3%. On the other hand, low participation rate, 62.2%. Wage growth was plus 0.2, as expected. Annual wage growth, still mediocre. And we had a small improvement in the real unemployment rate, 10.4%. All in all, very much as expected, no surprises, um, very steady, uh, very positive. So employment remains in general positive, but as we said, there's a but here, the inflation. So the Fed looks at core inflation, that's okay, it's at 1.7%, but the figure that interests the Fed even more is core PC price index, and that's only at 1.3%. And wages, which combine, well, employment and inflation, as I said, they're only 2.1%. So uh, the verdict, if we look only at inflation, is there's no rush. And we heard uh, yesterday from Stanley Fisher, um, or the day before, he said that if the Fed had only one mandate, which is uh, just to just inflation, it wouldn't it wouldn't be in a rush. Okay, so these mandates are confusing. In one hand, inflation says wait, and employment says go. Uh, but and, and there are, of course, other uh, factors. The Fed looks very closely at markets. Some say the Fed is working for Wall Street. I would say that's exaggerated. So inflation is lagging. Inflation comes after an improvement in, in employment. So the Fed needs to be ahead of the curve, raise rates before the economy st starts to boil. In addition, uh, zero in interest rates have been here forever. So it needs to show the markets that interest rates will not stay zero forever in order to prevent some kind of bubbles in real estate and stocks and everything else. In addition, uh, we had long months of expectations, long months of preparations. It needs to get it out of, the, out of the way. Afterwards, it can wait before the next hike. It can be even only in the next year, only in 2016. But um, we, we need to get the first rate hike out of the way. And if the Fed shows confidence by raising the rates, it could also help improve the mood about the U.S. economy. So in general, uh, the markets don't like an interest rate because it means less in, uh, motivation to invest in stocks. But on the other hand, if the dovish Fed raises the rates, that means the Fed is confident, and that's a good sign for the U.S. economy. But yes, why wait? Well, of course, inflation is too low. We, we talked about it. Uh, the Fed could fear not to choke the recovery because the recovery is still very fragile. Uh, not to create wild market reactions. We had the taper tantrum back in 2013, two years ago. But this time, I think markets are very well prepared. Um, and it doesn't want to strengthen the dollar too much. Of course, it cannot say that. 
because uh, the Fed uh, officially does not uh, work for the dollar, but uh, a, do a stronger dollar means um, less uh, inflation and weaker exports, a weaker economy and no inflation. So uh, that's basically the dilemma of the Fed. Uh, I still think that the Fed will raise rates. We'll talk about that uh, in September. We'll talk about that more. But now this week, there's a new factor. China. Well, an economic slowdown in China is not news. Uh, everybody's been talking about the soft landing or hard landing, rebalancing of the Chinese economy, the world's number two economy, and of course, a major trade partner of the US. That's been going on for years, I think two, three years. But we had a fall in the stock markets in the past two months or so. It's important to remember that this fall in the stock markets um, began after a huge bubble over there. So I think it's part of the game. If you have a rally, you have a crash, boom and bust. But anyway, uh, that's a negative sign. And we had outflows out of China. And the news from, from this week is, of course, the UN devaluation. Now, uh, the UN devaluation, um, they said they wanted to uh, let markets determine the exchange rate. Uh, to make uh, the yuan more of a reserve currency, to include it in the IMF's SDRs, to get it to, to do what the world actually expects it to do. On the other hand, uh, U.S. politicians, especially Republicans and mostly the outspoken uh, Donald Trump, uh, say that China is manipulating its currency. Uh, I think there is a real slowdown in the Chinese economy that does justify a fall in the currency. But anyway, uh, when the Chinese authorities let their currency slip, uh, many see that as a sign of trouble. Now, economically, um, if we have a weaker yuan against the US dollar, we have, um, yet again, um, harder for US exports to reach China and cheaper imports reach the US. So uh, the China could be doing the tightening uh, for the Fed. Um, that's what's written here on this slide. Um, so imported Chinese good, goods, and as we know, Americans consume a lot of Chinese products, cost less in the United States, inflation is even lower, and if exports to China cool down, there are of course less U.S. exports to China than U.S. imports from China, that works as sort of tightening. So Yellen could wait, and as this uh, intern meme says, you didn't expect me to be hawkish, did you? So that's the reason for Yellen to wait. Um, I still think they will not wait. Uh, here's the big question. What do you think it will be? Uh, of course, it's data dependent. Uh, let's look at the important figures. Tomorrow we have retail sales in the US. We have at the end of this month um, updated GDP. It's a bit less important. Core durable goods orders is important because it reflects investment. And of course, the NFP on September 4th, um, which is just two weeks before the Fed decision on September 17th, and that's when the Fed also enters its sort of quiet period. So we do hear a lot of noise from Fed officials uh, this week, and we'll, we might hear something next week, but once we have uh, the NFP coming out, uh, we'll have no Fed speak. That means uh, non from payrolls will get center stage. I think that if the non from payrolls is not a disaster, if it's okay, 200 plus thousand, then uh, a rate hike in September is certainly on the cards. I think they will want to get it out of the way to show that uh, employment is rising, the U.S. economy is improving, and that zero rates are not here forever. Um, if the NFP is amazing, there's even a chance of a second rate hike in September. But I think uh, the Fed wants to get one rate hike out of the way and then wait for a very long time. Um, if data is less than okay, that means under 200,000, a hike is expected only in December, and that could, of course, really weaken the dollar. Um, that's a really big event. Um, the timing of the first rate hike, hike and the expectations for the timing of the first rate hike have a huge, huge impact on the US dollar. This matters even though the balance sheet of the Fed remains large, uh, even if the pace will be gradual. We talked about the gradual pace. Um, but it's important to remember the Fed ended QE back in October, but didn't undo its QE. The balance sheet of the Fed is still $4.5 trillion. 
So every for every bond that matures uh, within the Fed's uh, coffers, uh, it buys another bond. It the, there is no tightening uh, in terms of uh, the Fed's balance sheet. It remains the same. So in a way, the Fed still prints dollars. It just doesn't enlarge them, it, but it doesn't go the other way. Okay. Uh, uh, so anyway, after the first rate hike, I think it could be a different story for the dollar. But for now, uh, it really, really matters. And the non-firm payrolls, which shapes expectations for September, also matters a lot. So if we put a few numbers into it, if we have 280,000 uh, or more, um, it's, of course, positive for the dollar. Under 200,000, it's negative for the dollar. And in between, it also depends on the wages. Um, I would say that if we have average hourly earnings of 2.3 year over year, it'll be positive and 2% or below, it'll be negative. Um, but uh, the number of jobs gained is more important than wages. Um, well, of course, if we have a figure that is exactly as expected and we have a very big variation in wages, wages become even more important. But I think, uh, I think it'll depend this time a bit more on the headline number. So, uh, what's next for your dollar short term? Well, uh, something that doesn't appear, well, it does appear here on the slide, keep an eye on China. So today we have a big rally in euro dollar because of China. Why? The market now believes the story that, which, well, believes the story that may, that may be true, that because of what's going on in China, uh, which has a huge impact on the world economy, it's number two economy in the world, and the sort of China tightening instead of the US, uh, the Fed might wait a few more months. If the Fed waits, there is no rush to buy US dollars. There is no rush to buy US dollars, and then that's the dollar side that weighs in the dollar. And that's why we're seeing the dollar slipping across the board. For the euro, if we have times of trouble, as we mentioned before, the euro becomes a funding, has become already a funding currency, so money comes back home. It's similar to the uh, events we had in Japan after the terrible disaster four years ago with the earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster. We had the yen strengthening uh, in the wake of this terrible catastrophe that also hit, of course, the Japanese economy. So that's positive for uh, the euro. So at the moment, if, if we have another devaluation of the yuan uh, tonight, I mean, in, in the Asian morning, that means uh, trouble for, um, uh, sorry, that means stronger euro dollar. That's for the short term, uh, really short term, the next few days. Uh, for the next few weeks, uh, non farm payrolls is, of course, critical for the Fed decision. Uh, Draghi, of course, is also important, but I think uh, all eyes in the first week of September, when all traders come back to their tables, will be on uh, the non farm payrolls. So Draghi could have an impact on Thursday, but the bigger impact will come on Friday with the NFP. In any case, a general tip of advice, we're seeing high volatility also now in August, and I think it will become even more extreme in uh, September. So don't use high leverage, trade responsibly. In the longer term, uh, I think we still see new lows in euro dollar. I think the Fed will hike before a comeback later in the year. Uh, why? Because the hike expectations in the U.S. Uh, still uh, help the U.S. dollar. But I think that around one month after the hike, euro dollar could start a nice recovery. There are good reasons for the euro to rise. And uh, we could see a change of uh, course of the long-term trend. But that could take some time. Okay, that's what I've prepared uh, for you guys. Uh, now it's time for questions. What do you think will be the next... Uh, direction of euro dollar uh, please ask questions in the chat box so while we wait for questions um, I'll use this uh, time to thank FX Street as always for hosting the webinar uh, you're welcome to visit forexcrunch.com and see the market movers listen to the market movers podcast 
My contact details are here. You're welcome to download the Android and iOS apps. And um, yeah, looking for questions. Chinese impact on the euro. Questions on the pound, on the Aussie, whatever you wish. I'm here. Which crosses can move the most uh, on what kind of action? I mean, you mean action in recent uh, days? Well, um, with the Chinese move, it's clearly hurting. Um, or the mo well, the mood changes all the time. Uh, what we had up to this morning here in Europe was that it weakened uh, the Australian and the New Zealand dollars and the Japanese yen and gave a boost to Euro. So the best crosses would be Euro Aussie, Euro Kiwi, uh, Euro Yen, uh, for example, or Pound also against the Yen, Pound Aussie, Pound Kiwi. But what we're seeing now is that the US dollar is just weakening against everybody else because of expectations of uh, that the Fed will delay a rate hike. Um, in any case, the euro works a bit as a safe haven. What impact on euro dollar if the yuan don't devalue to, I guess, was the volume? Well, I think that if the Chinese crisis, which is just two days old, it's important to remember, I mean, this, this round of crisis around the devaluation uh, eases, and there is a good chance because we are hearing rumors that uh, the People's Bank of China, the PBOC, the central bank there is intervening to stabilize the yuan. Um, I think we'll have uh, uh, the US dollar back to normal. Uh, that means euro dollar a bit lower, less safe haven flows to the euro, um, more stabilizing because traders will think it's just a short episode and the Fed will still hike. But uh, it still means trouble, I think, for the Aussie and the Kiwi. And the yen, which competes, Japan competes with China. So I think if we'll have a stabilization uh, tonight, an Asian morning, European night, then I think it could be negative for euro dollar. The fixed time is 1.15 GMT. So if anybody's awake, maybe it's evening in the United States, morning in Asia, uh, that's a critical time for markets now. The world is watching uh, China more closely. Hmm. Governor Wheeler said in June, Kiwi to rate decreases this year. So first of all, we had two rate cuts in uh, two rate cuts in New Zealand, from three fifty to three twenty five, and then to three. Um, some expected the RBNZ to cut rates uh, by 50 basis points this time, not 25 basis points. Uh, the signs we're seeing from the New Zealand economy is that it's weakening. Uh, with less demand from China, even for milk, which, which New Zealand exports, it could be negative. And I think, um, well, if, if the Kiwi falls on its own, the RBNZ could wait with another... A rate cut, it could keep more tools in its shed, so to speak. But if we have some kind of relief rally and the uh, Kiwi strengthens once again, I think uh, Wheeler and his colleagues will press the button once again and cut from 3 to, uh, to 275. So um, I think also in Australia and, and well in New Zealand, uh, both central banks are very, very minded of the exchange rate. We've seen in Australia how um, the... the the RBA, Glenn Stevens and his colleagues, changed their wording about the Australian dollar after it fell too much, maybe, in, in their opinion. Uh, they don't see it as too strong anymore. So I think, uh, I think a lot depends on the value of the, of the Kiwi for the next move.
More questions? Euro dollar, Kiwi, Aussie, pound. We had some action in the pound last week. Yen. Price of oil also has fallen quite a lot. It's of course, part of, part of the picture when we see uh, a slowdown in the global economy or expectations, and China has a lot to do with that, then uh, price of oil is falling. Of course, impacts the Canadian dollar. Seen some kind of recovery in oil, but <clears throat> the moment, uh, well, euro dollar reached uh, sort of some kind of peak at at one eleven eighty nine, just under resistance at one twelve. More questions? We have a few more minutes. You can ask me anything. Yes. Oh, I didn't see. That. So we have more questions. Okay. Uh, hiking interest rate in the U.S. will cause the stock market to decline sharply. Uh, I don't think so. If it's one rate cut with sort of some kind of sweetener, and uh, if they repeat once again that they're not going to raise rates very fast, do it very gradually, very data dependent, sort of make one move and see what happens. I think uh, stock markets will react. They might decline a bit, but not sharply. It's important to remember that the Fed is preparing markets for months for a rate hike. Dollar Swiss is down around 200 pips. Uh, uh, does the S&B intervene? Um, the S&B S &B would like to intervene to not to weaken uh, the Swiss franc, but to strengthen it. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Got myself confused. So, the uh, Swiss National Bank wants to see a weaker uh, Swiss franc. So, if dollar Swiss is down, that's undesired. Um, in any case, the Swiss National Bank intervenes in markets. It looks more closely at, at the euro because, well, if you look at the map, Switzerland is in the middle of the eurozone surrounded by your own countries and uh, um, it would like to have a weaker Swiss franc but that's basically what everybody wants everybody wants a weaker currency uh, what is your strategy what are you referring to strategy regarding in general what Forex Crunch talks about uh, what I talk about is fundamental analysis what moves markets uh, interest rates uh, expectations for, for for rates, uh, jobs, figures, uh, politics, of course, everything that moves markets, and uh, technicals, I advise on using technicals for entry and exit points in the shorter term because everybody looks at technicals. But for the bigger moves, uh, it's the fundamentals that move markets.
can you share a technical entry? Well, in general, I would say that um, I, I don't have a specific uh, trade I'm looking at at the moment. But in general, look at support and resistance lines. Um, look for breakouts. Usually the second breakout is the real one, not the first one can be a fake one. I have lots more detailed information on the website about that. Anyway, um, our time is coming uh, to uh, to an end. Let me thank again FX Street uh, for hosting this webinar. Uh, I do believe it's recorded. If you want to listen to to listen and to see it once again, um, welcome to visit Forex Crunch. Listen to the podcast. Contact me and download uh, the mobile apps. Uh, Anyway, safe trading. I'm glad to see that markets are moving also in the summer. And it's never boring. Um, in September, it'll be even more. Yes, the webinar is recorded. That's great. And it'll be available in a few hours. And uh, I hope to see you in September. And uh, uh, don't forget to take a break from the markets from time to time. It's vacation season. And um, see you soon. Uh, thank you very much and safe trading.